Well, stand with me and turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 20, the very last part of chapter 20, and be reminded as you turn there that this is God's holy word. It is completely inspired by the Holy Spirit and without error of any kind, and the only final authority in everything that we are supposed to believe and do. So be addressed by God as you hear these words. We're going to be looking at verses 29 through 34. And as they went out of Jericho, a great crowd followed him. And behold, there were two blind men sitting by the roadside. And when they heard that Jesus was passing by, they cried out, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. The crowd rebuked them, telling them to be silent. But they cried out all the more, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. And stopping, Jesus called them and said, What do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Lord, let our eyes be opened. And Jesus, in pity, touched their eyes, and immediately they recovered their sight and followed him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the power of your word, the healing power of your word and your son in this miracle and what it is a sign of and a great need that we have a spiritual blindness, the need to see, and ultimately, not only to see truth in some general way, but to see the glory of your Son. So, Lord, we pray that you would make that miracle happen of regeneration for any who are here today who do not know you. But for those of us that you have given eyes to see, Lord, we pray that you would continue to work that supernatural vision correction, that we would see more and more of your glory and your truth, and that it would change us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. The title of the message today is The Grace of Sight. And again, hopefully you can see the, the theme in the songs that were picked. Uh, but a uh, little bit of housekeeping first in terms of the actual text itself and comparing this to some other gospel texts. This story shows up in all three of the synoptic gospels, or at least some version of it. Uh, In Matthew's gospel, you see two blind men being healed as Jesus approaches Jerusalem. He does that by way of this place called Jericho. In Mark's gospel, there's only one man that's singled out, Bartimaeus. Ordinarily, when you have that situation in two or more gospels, You've got more options in reconciling the accounts. Usually the first thing you turn to to make sense of it is maybe there were different occasions. That happens sometimes in the Gospels. But here that's less likely just because the time of it and the place of it. In both it says, as they went out of Jericho, and the idea is that he's on his way to Jerusalem toward the end. You can see that in Mark 10, verse 46. So the usual second recourse when you're looking at the two Gospels and comparing them is different emphases, and usually in a clear pattern that makes sense of how the Gospel writers had a very unique audience, and we've been talking about Matthew's audience, and we'll see that that is the case here. It's just a little harder to see it, plus you have an added difficulty, because in Luke's Gospel, the miracle is spoken of as being when he drew near to Jericho chapter 18, verse 35. Now, that's just the ESV, though, because I think that there is some Greek that'll help us uh, in the words that are used, and you even see it in the English. If you look in Luke's gospel, and not to bring in too much of other gospels here, but in Luke 18, 35, you'll notice that there's two prepositions used for in and to in this statement. And so, the Berean Bible, I think, really, really captures this in saying it came about in the drawing near of him to Jericho. And you also have an added story right next to it about that man named Zacchaeus, who's up in the tree, and and the salvation that had come to his household, it's in the same context, and so it may be that he re-enters Jericho from there. 
Now, there's uh, different ways that different commentators will handle this. That's kind of the way I handle it. Luke's speaking somewhat generically about the time that he was in Jericho. He's not being specific. But other commentators, they, they like to try to solve this by doing more acrobatics, I guess, to sell more copies of their commentary. I don't know. But sometimes they'll, they, they say, well, maybe there was two Jerichos. And of course, there was a Jericho in the ancient, more ancient world in the Old Testament. We know about that. problem is that doesn't really tell us any information about that in the Gospels. Uh, another solution is to say, well, maybe one blind man was healed upon the entrance and the other blind man is healed upon the exiting. Well, that certainly makes sense between Mark and Luke. The uh, problem here is that Matthew treats these two as something that happened all at once. And then another option is still to point to the Zacchaeus story in Luke and to say, well, he's actually re-entering the city of Jericho as he's there for a while on his way to Jerusalem. I think that third answer has the fewest amount of difficulties, but, but again, I would just point out to the fact that Luke is speaking generically of the time during which he was in uh, Jericho. So that's just if, if you know about this or even if you don't, you know, how do I make sense of two verses one and so forth? kind of like the women at the tomb. Some Gospels will record and only focus on the one. Other Gospels will focus on the women in general and so forth. That's what we call complementary information. One Gospel is just giving us more information there. So that's just so you, you know that, just the textual issue there. But here's now the question is, what does it mean? What's, what is this in the Bible for? And in fact, it's in Matthew, it's a very small section. How do you even get truth out of that? In fact, he's, he's already healed blind people. Uh, a lot of the features that we'll see here are, are in other stories. So, so what do you actually get out of this? Well, here's what we're going to see in three parts. We're going to see, number one, the obvious meaning of the title, Son of David. Secondly, we'll see the offensive sound of the cry, Son of David. And then thirdly, the opening of our sight to the Son of David. So here's the big idea. If you get lost at any point, here's the doctrine. Here's the truth the big idea that we're to take from this, and that is that the nearer to Christ in sin, in other words, the nearer you get to the truth, the nearer you are to God's things, the clearer the picture you have in front of you, and you're still in sin, the blinder the eye, except for the grace of sight. We saw that a little bit in the class today, that the, the people who are nearest to God, but they're not converted. This is true of angels, by the way, too. This is why the, the fallen angels are irredeemable. But it's true of the Jewish people who had the clearest sight of God, who are in covenant relationship to God. But it's most true of the people who had a front row seat to Jesus Christ. They were staring right at Him. And yet, if they were unconverted, they had the hardest hearts of all. You see this theme everywhere in Scripture. So the nearer to Christ in sin, the blinder the eye, except for the grace of sight. So let's first do a little definition work of the thing that these blind men said. The obvious meaning of the title, Son of David. And I know we've seen this before, but it's at the heart of the passage, and it said twice, Lord, have mercy on us, Son of David. You, you also see this theme as well. Whoever's sick, whoever's blind, whoever's deaf, even the people that are demon-possessed, these people always seem to make a clearer, truer profession of Christ than all the people that say, we see perfectly, the religious leaders. It's these people that are down and out and hurting and broken that Jesus is about to heal. They're always the one that seem to make this profession of Christ, and that's not for nothing. Uh, we've heard this title before, Son of David, three times in chapter 9, chapter 12, and chapter 15. Son of David. What does it mean? If you haven't caught it before, it's very, very significant. It refers to Jesus as the ultimate fulfillment of the promise that the Lord made to David way back in 2 Samuel 7. In verse 12 and 13, the Lord is saying to David, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Now, when he says he will come from my body and he will build this house that you're building, he'll really build it, the immediate fulfillment of that is Solomon. And we know that because the rest of the passage after those words go on to talk about how Solomon, when he falls, I will chastise him, but, but I will not leave him. My love and my mercy will not leave him as I did with Saul. So there he's... And by the way, that's a verse you can use for, was Solomon saved? 
Uh, in that Davidic promise of the throne, I think we have pretty good indication that Solomon was saved in the end. Because part of that problem, now he doesn't mention Solomon there, but that's the immediate fulfillment of the one who would come from David's loins and he would build this house and so forth. But in, the immediate, in, in those, those two first verses, Christians everywhere have recognized this to be a prophecy of Jesus Christ. And of course, that's what the word Messiah means. The Jews were waiting for the one who would come from David who would be the Christ. Christos in the Greek just means the same as Messiah in the, in the Hebrew. It, it means the anointed one the one who will be the king, the one who will rule, who will be God's ruler over the whole world. And so this is about Israel's throne. This is about Israel's kingdom. This is about the city of God on earth and its king. But ultimately, it was not only a promise made to David. It was a promise we see elsewhere that is made directly to Jesus in heaven. In Psalm 110.1, in the most quoted part of the Old Testament in the New Testament, if you ever get that in a trivia contest, remember that, Psalm 110. It's the most cited passage in the Old Testament in the New Testament. It's a good reason. The Lord said to my Lord, the Lord, capital L-O-R-D in your English Bibles, Yahweh, the unspeakable name of God, says to my Lord. Now, this is David talking. David doesn't have a, a Lord over him that's human because an Adonai is used in the next word, Lord, and it's lowercase in your Bible. And Jesus quotes from this, and he makes this very point to trip up the Pharisees. Then why did David say, the Lord said to my Lord, the Lord God promised me, David, that my Lord, David doesn't have a Lord, he's the king. But he says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. So here you have back in Matthew, Blind peasants in a crowd of mostly other peasants. And yet these were like two heralds making way for the king. So if you didn't already know that this was the king, or if you had heard before and were skeptical, or if you were downright threatened by this announcement of the king, this would not have been lost on you if you were there at that day. They were making a claim that was very theological, and they were making a claim that was very political. This was a very intrusive claim that had impact on everyone. It would have risen to the top of the charts in the most uncomfortable, awkward, offensive religious or political statement that you could make at that time. And the truth is, it still is, if you can hear it and if you can appreciate it for what it is. Now, you may not be aware, but in our day, just now, really, the last few months, it's trending on social media, the expression, Jesus is Lord, which you might have taken as commonplace. You might have had bumper stickers or, I don't know, a t-shirt or a coffee mug or something that said Jesus is Lord may have been very normal to have on church marquees for years. Jesus is Lord has now been declared over the past few weeks an anti-Semitic slur. Did you know that? I'm not surprised. In a sense, there's always been voices that have claimed that Christianity is this, or the Bible is homophobic, the Bible is sexist, the Bible is racist, the Bible is anti-Semitic. It's, it's old in a sense, but it's in a very specific way. It's being marked out as hate speech all of a sudden on social media. Jesus is Lord. But actually, that makes sense, and they're actually being consistent because the claim that Jesus is Lord or that the Son of David is here is a claim that the king of all kings has come and, and you are to bow down to him. You are to repent. You are to give your life and everything in it over to his rule and reign. And these are just a bunch of blind beggars who are saying this. So the second point, this starts to make sense of why this is offensive. The offensive sound of the cry, son of David. Now, at first, if you just come to this and just going through your Bible, your daily Bible reading plan, it, it might seem a little odd at first, the offense. The crowd, in verse 31, rebuked them, telling them to be silent. It's not just, well, they're mean and they're bullies and they're just, these just blind people that are inconvenient to them and they're pushing them aside. Well, that may have been uh, part of these people's inhumanity. That, that's certainly true, but that doesn't really explain everything, why everybody in unison is saying, shh, shh, shut up, shut them up. It doesn't really explain 
why that's happening. This offense, is, is this about like a acceptable noise levels, like a city ordinance or something? Didn't have anything like that back then. Was it that they were overpowering the crowd? Hardly possible. It was a, it was a crowd. Were they impeding the crowd? Getting in their way? Again, no. They were blind. They couldn't even make any headway at all. In other words, this is all about offensive content. It always is. Tone police are never really policing tone and manners at the end of the day. They're always policing offensive comment. And they're changing the subject to manners and virtues for one reason and one reason only. It is to intimidate truth tellers so as to silence the truth. That is not new. That has never changed and it never will until Christ returns. Close the mouth, close the ears, so that all of our eyes can remain closed. Keep a lid on this. If this gets out, if too many people are given this disinformation, people might start to see something. Seeing is the enemy of blind power. Now, this is the second time that Matthew has recorded blind men confessing Jesus as the son of David. You remember in chapter 9, in, in verse 27, you had blind men who saw something of Jesus that people with two perfectly good physical eyes were blinded to. And here I think we start to see another reason for the emphasis on the two men in Matthew's gospel versus the one in Mark, rather than the more notable man named Bartimaeus, on the testimony of two or three blind witnesses, every charge against the spiritually blind would be established. You had blind Israel, called blind in various places of the Scripture, blind Jerusalem, scribes, Pharisees, and elders of the city of God that are three times in this gospel called blind guides. Chapter 15, verse 14, chapter 23, verse 16, and then in that same chapter, verse 24, the leaders of the city of God, the people who their whole job description, like if you were a spiritual HR department of heaven and you just came with your badge and said, what do you do around here anyway? It doesn't look like you're doing anything. What do you do? Uh, they, would, they would say, well, our job, we have a very important job. It's, it's to wait for the king. It's to make way for the Messiah by what we do. They were blind at that job. And so the literally blind were called as a witness, according to the rules of the law of Moses, against those who were most willfully blind in spirit. Spiritual blindness. We've seen that the miracles that Jesus performs, whether it is the casting out of demons, whether it is the healing of the deaf and the mute, or the lame, or the leper, or whatever it is, is always a sign of some spiritual malady that we have and that we need healed. So what's spiritual blindness? Well, it's natural, just like physical blindness is, but here it's something we've inherited from our forefather Adam. The Bible is always talking about our, our lack of regeneration in ways that have to do with our senses, that we lack taste for the Spirit, that we're, that we're deaf. And yes, blindness is something that the Scriptures talk about as our not being able to see the kingdom of God. That's why the first thing Jesus says in John 3.3, 3, unless you're born again, you cannot, what? See the kingdom of God. In our shorter catechism class this morning, we looked at question 82, and it asked the question, are all transgressions of the law, in other words, are all sins equally heinous? And the answer was, some sins in themselves, and by reason of several aggravations, in other words, some things that make them more sinful than others, are more heinous in the sight of God than others. So one response to that we looked at this morning is, well, how can that be? Because if all sins deserve the curse and the wrath of God, well, by aggravation, those Puritans that drew that up, they meant that we can sin more by degree in ways that we've seen in this gospel. Just a couple of examples and the Jews are guilty of all of this. The more influence we have over others, as the leaders of Jerusalem had, the more guilty we are for those sins. How near we get to handling the holy things of God if we take upon ourselves, preacher, 
That's why James 3.1 says, let not many of you pre, uh, teach, for with teaching comes the stricter standard. Israel, the priests and the scribes, they were more guilty than the average person. How patient God has been with us, causing His Son to rise on us each morning when by rights He could have judged us and wiped us out overnight. And we sin and sin and sin the next day. Therefore, we have a greater sin in sinning against His mercy and His blessing. And He had been very patient with Israel for centuries. Or how close we get to the truth, not just handling His things, but how close we get to seeing His truth and how clear it is to us. As those who saw Jesus face to face had the greatest amount of clarity than anyone else on earth. And so it would seem that those who were spiritually blind here checked each and every one of those boxes of the most heinous sins. And so thirdly, there's the opening of our sight of the Son of David. Not just their sight of the Son of David. This is not just something that represents something for them. It's something that's in the Bible, as the Bible tells us, that all Scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable. And it goes on to talk about for every good work. And so this text is for us. This miracle is telling us about something that we need. Note, note the persistence here in verse 31, but they cried out all the more. These who were told to shut up, they were not taking shut up for an answer. The opening of sight creates a hunger of the eye. And the hunger of the eye is a hunger for light. And being blind, they couldn't see physically, but they were already looking for Christ, notice the text says. And so they could see more than those with two physical good eyes. Matthew already told us that in verse 30, when they heard that Jesus was passing by, the sense is of hearing about someone that they had already heard about. And so the interplay here is important. It's, it's not that the purpose of this text is not to get caught up in a whole doctrine of salvation. This happens a lot, I, I think, when we first come to Reformed theology, is we start comparing not only every parable and every detail, but we start comparing all the different parts of the miracles of Jesus to this or that part of, we, we get our little chart out and we say, well, well, he came first, or she's, he said, your faith has made you well. Does that mean now I, and now we, we get embarrassed by the text? That's not the point of the text. It's really only telling us something about the power of Jesus and the particular need that he's meeting. It's not given there to, to analyze who moved first, but if you want to play that game, uh, if, if you want to analyze that, there's an obligation here to look, even for the blind just as Lazarus was obligated to get up when the Lord said to Lazarus, come forth in John 11. He was obligated to obey his master. It's a picture. We're obligated to respond to Jesus, but we can't because we're spiritually dead until he raises us. And so he says to the blind in Isaiah 42, look, you blind, that you may see. That's an odd command to the blind. Look here. But, but Jesus is saying through the prophet Isaiah, look and be healed. So if you do want to compare this to your understanding of the doctrine of salvation, well, let's just review the order here. Jesus comes to town first. Jesus makes the first move. This was Jesus' idea. All of his healings, all that he does, he always initiates. He remains sovereign. Secondly, they heard. Then he passes by. Then they hear that it's happening, and then finally the moment. And so it says in verse 32, and stopping, Jesus called them and said, what do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Lord, let our eyes be opened. And Jesus in pity touched their eyes, and immediately they recovered their sight. And followed him. By the way, that's another thing you see in the miracles of Jesus. You always see in the backdrop another contrast. The pity and the compassion of Jesus versus pretty much everybody else in the picture that's always like bent out of shape. Like, why are you doing this on the Sabbath? And or you weren't really blind. And, and they're always finding fault. But Jesus is always there with pity and compassion. These blind men also had a feeling. Jesus had a feeling. Their feeling was a desire for restoration. He asked them, what do you want? And their desire was for restoration. Their desire was to see. 
even after they had heard of Jesus. His feeling was pity. And notice these were not just blind men. These were beggars. That's another thing we all are before we come to Christ. We're beggars. You ever hear, beggars can't be choosers? Well, that's really true in the case of being a spiritual beggar. We have nothing to commend to God. We have nothing, you know, like the hymn says, nothing in my hands I bring, but simply to thy cross I cling. But they were dependent upon the system and the kind of people who were currently telling them to shut up. Imagine if Jesus wasn't there and it was just up to the religious leaders. They were dependent on these people. What they needed was to find a king independent of that system. And incidentally, everybody in this crowd here was breaking the law. They always are when they're charging Jesus with breaking the law. They're actually the ones breaking the law. You shall not put a stumbling block before the blind, Leviticus 19.14. And cursed be anyone who misleads a blind man on the road, Deuteronomy 27.8. Well, what greater stumbling block, what worse kind of misleading could there be than to prevent the blind from seeing the light of Christ? I wonder if we could be guilty of putting stumbling blocks before the blind or we could mislead a blind man on the road. In other words, we can get in the way of or veer somebody out of the way of seeing the light of Christ when they can't see the light of Christ. I think if we put it that way, we can be guilty of breaking the law there. But if you want to know finally how good their eyes were when they got these new eyes, how much they were the exact opposite of the blindness of all these silencers in the crowd. How does it end? It says, and immediately they recovered their sight and followed him. This is exactly what all the miracles of Jesus do too. They don't create these passive people. Now, when there's exceptions, it's meant to make a distinction between those who were grateful and thankful and those who weren't. There was a time where uh, one of these people is healed and they're there and, and the rest of them are just sort of back in the city and it's like this detail. But in, in most of the miracles of Jesus, what well, you see are just very, very grateful, thankful people. In fact, they're so excited and filled with joy. Sometimes they disobey Jesus when he says, don't tell anybody, and they just go on and start telling everybody about it. And that's there for a reason too. But, but new life looks like something. When Jesus actually heals you, when he gives you your spiritual life, when he gives you spiritual eyes and spiritual ears, you follow him. So what's the first thing that these people saw when they were given new eyes? They saw the eyes of the King of Kings, and they followed him. They dropped everything. They did what the disciples did. They realized that they were just beggars before that. They had nothing at all. Their life is really meaningless without Christ. And so you think to yourself, okay, that was true for them, but not for the, the important people in the crowd. And immediately you should say to yourself, wait a minute, wait a minute. I was blind. I was a beggar. I have to be poor in spirit. What does Jesus say? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Outside of that, outside of being, you should be so blind. You should be such a beggar because outside of that, what you think is important, what I thought was important in this life is going away. So they followed him with their new eyes. And so we have to ask ourselves, if God's grace has given us new eyes, what are we doing with them? Are we looking to see more of Jesus are we looking to follow him? Is the answer that when he asked them, what do you want me to do for you? Is that our answer as we come to church every Sunday? Open up my eyes. That I can behold wonders out of your law, as the psalmist says. So as we apply this to our lives in a couple different ways, just really briefly, this, this passage is an admonition to us. This is a warning to us. Those who have not only all of their senses, but those who have and I take it, if you're here today, you have all of your, or at least most of your senses. And here, I'm, I'm just, I'm not even talking about mentally. I mean, sometimes we can come to church just like you can, you know, go to your job in the morning and not feel like you have all of your senses. But here, I'm just talking about your five senses and, and also full health and other physical advantages. We can be thankful for that, but I think we should be mindful of it too. We should be aware your advantage, my advantage, very often is a disadvantage spiritually. Advantages in this world, advantages to obtain things in this world, are often a snare toward spiritual advantages. It's been observed 
by many people that the loss of one sense, say blindness or deafness, that the loss of one sense causes several other senses to become more acute. Now, I don't, I don't know the science of that personally. I've just heard that a bunch of times in my life. I don't know if that's the case. But I do know this. I do know that the good things of this life in the hands of sinners is a powerful drug. Whether it be connection, power, money, beauty, whatever it is, perfect sight, perfect hearing, all these different things, I don't, I don't have that. I don't have to, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not in a wheelchair. I, I don't have to deal with that. And we can be thankful for that. We should be thankful for that. But we should also be mindful of that. If you are too comfortable in this time and place, then what you see now can be very, very deceiving. You know, when Paul said, we walk by faith, not by sight, I always tell people, he doesn't say, we walk by faith, not by reason. He's not pitting those against each other. But when he says by sight, he means what you see in this world now in your own fallen reason, what you think is most real, what it seems most imposing, what you're most anxious about is not real, not by comparison. And so just be mindful of that. Sometimes God ordains crosses for us. Sometimes God hems us in or doesn't allow us to see precisely so that we can know how dependent we are on Him and turn to Him. This passage is for our instruction We saw what spiritual blindness means, but what does it mean in the grand scheme of things for us personally? Well, Paul gives us the truth in two stages. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, he's talking about the unbelievers, all who are outside of Christ, and he says, in their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. So we have this sin nature in us already. We're born into this world in sin, but what Paul's saying there is that on top of that, the devil has blinded the minds of unbelievers. There's a spiritual reason. There's a spiritual cause that if the Holy Spirit has not given you a new new heart, there's a reason you can't see the truth. And they're not natural reasons that can be naturally explained away or gotten around. There's a spiritual reason blindness. There's an inability to see who Christ is. And so there's a desperate dependence that He would give us new eyes. And so that's the good news is Paul ends that by saying, for God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And so Paul uses the same words he uses about the blindness. And then he says, but God, The same God who said, let there be light in the beginning. He, in effect, says, let there be a Christian. Let there be light in your soul. Let there be new eyes. He creates new spiritual eyes. He creates sight. And if you're a Christian at all, and you can see the gospel, and you can believe, and you can know that this is reality, and this world is going away, If you can see that, that's a miracle, and you can thank God for it. And we need to pray that that would be what God does for those who do not believe. This is the normal grace of sight. In between those two verses, Paul sandwiches in the role of the gospel preacher, or really any Christian who brings the truth to other people. He says, for what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ. We are servants for that. And he says, the way that God turns the lights on is through the Word, through the Gospel, through the exact Jesus that is in this book, in the exact way that He saved us. And so Jesus' healing is a sign of that. He sends the Spirit and the Word to give eyes today. The only question left is, will you take the same advantage to yourself as these two blind beggars did? Will you meet the Lord on the path where you can actually find Him, where He actually is in His gospel and in the means of grace that He has given to His church? And will you cry out to Him as a spiritual beggar? He says to us, as He said to that ancient church 
In Revelation 3, it was in our confession time. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire, so that you may be rich, and white garments, so that you may clothe yourself, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and salve to anoint your eyes, so that you may see. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you would open up our eyes. We pray that by this word and through the Lord's Supper we're about to take, that you would help us see Jesus Christ. Help us to see him in our place, all of our sin going to him and all of his righteousness coming to us through faith alone. Help us believe that and receive that. Help us to see our condition as spiritual beggars and blind without you and create in us a new vision and expand our vision. Give us more grace, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.